two little, it's six or seven, what, seven chapters, I think. But if you go to the, between the middle, and, or, you know, between the Testaments, go to Matthew chapter one, or Malachi chapter four, and then you take a hard left, it's a few books to your left. And it's kind of interesting because it's kind of an obscure book. It's not cited a lot, but it has a, what's considered an obscure verse in it. And I want to talk to you today about the birth certificate of Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you about his birth certificate because, you know, uh, birth certificates are important. You need a birth certificate to travel abroad. I mean, you need a proof of, you know, your origins or who you are before you can really get a passport. Very important. In fact, there's a lot of controversy as I speak right now in the courts regarding the birth certificate of Barack Obama. Uh, there's a lot of people who have challenged uh, Alan Keyes, who ran against him, brought a suit uh, against uh, whether or not he has a birth certificate. And uh, there's other people that have brought, are bringing this to the courts and what have you. They've been looking at it. Uh, of course, they don't want to look at it. Uh, this is something, uh, this would be uh, really hard in the nation. A lot of people view if you are able to prove that he was not born in Hawaii, which is part of the United States, but was born in Kenya, as some people allege that he was, and they believe there's relatives that have stated that, and they allege that, you know, there's no witnesses to his birth here, and there's no, he hasn't been able to produce a bona fide birth certificate, and what have you. And so there's all this controversy. In fact, I just saw an AOL poll uh, a few days ago that showed that the majority of Americans believe it's a very important issue, because you see, to become the the president of the United States, uh, you must be a natural born citizen of this country. And so it's a very important issue because they believe it would undermine the very Constitution on the most fundamental level uh, and what have you. So it's a big controversy uh, going on right now whether Barack Obama uh, is truly a natural-born citizen of the United States of America. And that's not what I'm going to talk about. That's in the news. I want to talk about somebody else's birth certificate. I want to talk about the birth certificate of the Lord Jesus Christ because, you see, Uh, It's one thing to be the president of a nation and need to have a birth certificate, but you also need the proper birth certificate if you are going to be the savior of the world, the Messiah, you see. And I love the birth certificate of the Lord Jesus Christ because it's verifiable. I love it because it's so spectacular. And one of the crazy things about his birth certificate, which makes it different than all of our birth certificates, is that it was written before he was born. Hundreds of years before he was born. There's nobody here who has a birth certificate that was written, uh, you know, where they would be born and the date and what sex you would be and what have you, uh, you know, long before you were actually born. Not a one. In fact, if it was the case, everybody would be tripping out. But I'll tell you what, we do over Jesus because that's exactly the case with our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Now, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, regarding Jesus' birth certificate, it tells us where he would be born. Now, your birth certificate, and there's different types of birth certificates. There's shorter versions. There's longer versions. Uh, uh, Going along with what Roger was saying, I'm going to look at the longer version of the birth certificate. Of course, I'm not just going to give you the name and the weight. Amen? I feel you want a little substance before you leave here today. Uh, But there's some things I want you to consider about his birth certificate. And that is, you know, the scriptures tell us he'd be born in Israel and the country of his birth. But more than the country, like other birth certificates, it tells us the very town where he would be born. Before he was born, hundreds of years, over 400 years before he was born, uh, we read this prophecy in verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. Now, this is interesting as well. It goes on to say, his goings forth will be from long ago, from the days of eternity. From the days of eternity. In other words, he'll be born in Bethlehem, but his origins, even though... He'll be born in Bethlehem as a human being. His origins will actually precede his date of birth on this planet, and they go forth to the days of eternity. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, we read of Jesus that he is without beginning of days. And the King James, it says, his goings forth are from everlasting. We read of God himself that he is from everlasting to everlasting. How long is to everlasting without what? 
without end. What is from everlasting without beginning? He's without beginning of days. Yet he would be born in Bethlehem. And it's interesting because the author, the, the prophet Micah, he shows us the unlikelihood that he would be born in Bethlehem and mentions that Bethlehem is, is too little among the clans of Judah. It's such a small area. In fact, uh, I made a few trips to Israel, and my second trip, we weren't allowed to go to Bethlehem. The third trip, we were advised not to, and we, tried to, we were considering going anyway, and we got close enough to look at it uh, from a distance. And it's quite a picturesque setting in the distance of the, you know, the shepherd's fields where David wrote the Psalms about you know, the handiwork of the Lord and the stars and the moon and the sun being the work of his hands in those shepherd fields. And, and then the, the little town, you see this, uh, it, you know, it's kind of like a, a white, you know, like it's made out of stone almost. And it's, it's quite beautiful. Actually, when you get in there, which my the first time I went to, my, to Israel, I was able to go into Bethlehem. And the scene in Bethlehem, is not like, you know, you think of when you see Christmas cards, you know. And I don't think it was like that when Jesus was born either. It was quite hectic, amen. In fact, uh, everybody in Israel was to return to their native land where they were born, the very towns they were born in, because uh, Caesar had a census going on to where people needed to determine uh, how much taxes they had to go back to your original town. And Joseph and Mary, of course, left Nazareth and went back to Bethlehem. And what a perfect place, though, for Jesus to be born. That was where King David lived. That's where he arose from Bethlehem. And Jesus would be the son of David, the descendant of David. It's, it's picturesque in so many ways because Bethlehem is the place five miles, by the way, from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, of course, is where the temple stood and where literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lambs had been sacrificed through the years. And God called for uh, the sacrifice. Of course, uh, every one of us sacrifices either animals or plants to eat. Amen? They sacrifice their lives so we can live. If you're against it, you will starve to death. Okay? So everybody believes in sacrifice for physical life. Well, God says there's far more than the need of the sacrifice of a lamb. It's not, it's not physical life, for spiritual life. Because our lives are really what we owe God because of our sin. So the lamb sacrifice, the lamb would have to be spotless, a male without blemish, and adult and what have you, because it was all a picture of Jesus. And they were born in Bethlehem. This is where, like David, for instance, had flock of sheep. The shepherds were throughout Bethlehem. And most of the lambs came five miles south of Jerusalem from Bethlehem and were brought to Jerusalem for Passover. And many of you have known, I, if you haven't heard the message, I, you could request it for free in the front uh, on Jesus being our Passover lamb. Uh, and I go through a whole message where we show what the Passover lamb was all about and how it was such an incredible picture in the Old Testament where God develops this picture of a male unblemished lamb as a picture of his son. And these, if, if Israel was to escape the death of their firstborn and have the angel pass over, they would have to put the blood of this innocent lamb on the doorpost and on the lentil. Okay, and then there, would be, there was a basin below okay, where, uh, where, where the blood would drop. And you would have what? A perfect cross. And the blood spotted exactly where Jesus' blood would be on the cross from his head wounds, his hands, his feet. And when the angel saw the blood splattered in the form of a cross 3,500 years ago, guys, okay, talking a long time ago, the Passover, the uh, death angel would pass over those homes and spare them. Well, this is all a picture as the Apostle Paul says, by the way, what, when was Jesus crucified? What day? On Passover day in Israel. Why? It's just so, it's such an obvious picture, you see, and because Jesus is the Lamb of God, as John said, John the Baptist, behold, when he baptized him, and he saw him coming up, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, all those sacrifices the Israelites did, they had to do over and over and over and over again because they never could what? Take away their sins. But when Jesus came, because they all pictured him, because a lamb really can't die in your place. A lamb can't pay your fine. Just a simple, regular lamb. They're not equivalent to human beings. You're made in the image of God but they can give a good picture of innocence. 
and of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of detail we go into in that message that just, I love typologies because they just show you so many facets of our Messiah, who Jesus is, amen? And Jesus actually died on Passover day, as you read through the Gospels. And he, on Passover, they would have to look at the lamb for five days and make sure it was without blemish and test it and look at it, check it out, before they would sacrifice it. Well, Jesus went into Jerusalem, we're told, five days before his crucifixion. And they inspected him, and they looked at him, and they tried to find sin in him, and they, they put on trial, and Pilate washed his hand, and he said, I, I find no, no, no crime in him. And it fulfilled the passage, Isaiah 53, which says that he would be without sin, without guile. And it was fitting that Jesus would be born then in Bethlehem, where the lambs were provided to Jerusalem, being the very lamb of God. But it's also fitting because Bethlehem means literally house of bread. Bethlehem is the Hebrew word for house of bread. And it's fitting that Jesus would be born in the house of bread. And it was fitting that he was actually laid in a feeding trough where, where animals would feed because Jesus is the bread, he said, who comes down from heaven, amen? Born in the house of bread in a feeding trough. And when we take communion later, I'd like you to keep that in mind because he said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And we don't literally eat Jesus' physical body, but just as the manna that Jesus talked about when he said he's the bread of life was a picture of him. The manna that fell from heaven was not him, but it was a picture of him. So the bread we take at the end that he told us to take is a picture of his sacrifice on the cross and giving his life for us, our spiritual food, so we can have eternal life and be spiritually nourished. Amen? So what a beautiful, there's so much beautiful truth you know, and it, it breaks my heart that Christmas time, you know, people hear and we sing songs about Bethlehem, what have you, but there's, the Bible is so rich. And a lot of times people don't get, buy a Christmas card and, and they, 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 oh, it's great. And then they just move on and they don't realize, wow, do you realize that the whole plan that God has for our redemption of humanity is so deep in every facet and just where he'd be born on his birth certificate has incredible meaning. But I love that part of his birth certificate and that it was written ahead of time that he would be born in Bethlehem. And I love the fact that God moved heaven and earth to make sure the place that he'd be born right there. And he used the circumstances of, of the greed of Rome taxing the Jews to bring it to pass and move them back to Bethlehem. And if you were angels, right, and you were in on, you know, they weren't in on all of it. They were, they were beholding, it says in the book of Ephesians, looking at what God was doing. But if you were angels and you were in the know, and you saw Mary and Joseph in Nazareth, you might be like, that's a long way from Bethlehem. How's that going to happen? This prophecy has got to be fulfilled. And then all of a sudden, they see God moving heaven and earth, moving things in such a way where everybody has to go. But you'd never make a trip while you're pregnant to Bethlehem from Nazareth. It's a long journey arduous journey. I mean, just driving from Nazareth, you know, to Jerusalem is a drive, but I can't imagine walking it. And I can't imagine, well, I don't want to imagine being pregnant walking. I'm a guy, but that's got to be pretty tough, you know. So pretty amazing how God did that, and he pulled that off. Uh, also, it says regarding a lot of things regarding the place he was born, but I really think uh, that's just an amazing, incredible, uh, incredibly amazing prophecy indeed. Now, sex. The sex. One thing you see on a birth certificate is the sex of the baby. And in Jesus' case, his birth certificate said hundreds of years before he'd be born that it would be a boy. It's a boy. I mean, that's great ultrasound, huh? I mean, ultrasound can be really good, but can you imagine? I mean, hundreds of years before, and actually thousands in certain prophecies, that he would be a male. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, a very awesome prophecy. In fact, you might want to turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isn't it great? Because Isaiah is the book that tells us that where God says in chapters 42 through 47 that he knows the end from the beginning. And he says the false gods can't tell you the end from the beginning. And he says, I alone know the end from the beginning. And over and over again, that part of the credentials that he is the one true God is 
prophecy. And I love the fact that so many of the prophecies about Jesus, that most of them, most of the most precious prophecies about Jesus are in Isaiah. And I love that because Isaiah was one of the books that was most attacked by critics for years because it had so many prophecies about Jesus. And I love it because the attacks went like, well, you know what? Because, I mean, think about Isaiah. I mean, you know, how many of you, you, know, how many of you witnessed to Jews with Isaiah 53? Raise your hand. Okay. Hands sprinkled over throughout here and there. It's a great chapter to use, right? I was just talking to a brother recently, and, he's, and we're, we went through Isaiah 53, by the way, uh, a few months ago, just before we went to Israel. And I was just talking to a brother recently. He was saying, yeah, he loves to give Isaiah 53 too. And, you know, he loves to give it to people. And, just, uh, and I, I like to share Isaiah 53 this way as well, is, is just give it to somebody and have them read it. Don't tell them it's Isaiah 53. Just give them the prophecy. Open the Bible and just say, read this. Tell me who this is about and where it's from. And invariably... You know, in, almost invariably, right? When you read Isaiah 53, they're going to say, if a Jewish person is going to say, well, it's about Jesus. Yeah. Well, where is it from? And that's the, that's the clincher as far as proving who he is because uh, it's from their Old Testament. Amen? It's from the Old Testament. It's from Isaiah. And uh, all the, throughout Isaiah 53, and I, if you haven't read Isaiah 53 or you haven't read it lately, I encourage you to read it. It's such a powerful prophecy about the circumstances of his death. Even his birth, it says he would be a root coming out of dry ground. It was quite dry when he was born, you see. And it's interesting because it's an Isaiah that was so criticized because there was only one manuscript that was complete of the book of Isaiah. And it wasn't until a thousand years after Christ that you have that full Masoretic text of Isaiah. That's a long time after Christ. However, it's important for you to know that a lot of the great classics in, uh, from Greek classics and whatever have you are hundreds of years, thousands, more than a thousand years, many of them after the author or after the writer, and they don't dispute them. But Isaiah came under great dispute because that was the first complete copy that you could see. Now, it was easy even then to refute the critics. Why? Because there were thousands of quotations from Isaiah in the early church fathers and elsewhere and prior to Christ in smaller parts here and there of Isaiah. So we knew Isaiah existed. You know? However, there was a great discovery that showed how awesome Isaiah the prophet was and how what he wrote was unchanged. And that was, of course, what was discovered. Come on. The Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, and they were discovered in 1947, just before Israel became a nation again in 1948, which is also prophesied throughout what? Isaiah. It was fitting for God to do that. And it's amazing how God had the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered because there was an incredible snowstorm in Israel where even Tel Aviv, which doesn't get snow, was covered with snow. And it drove people all over the place. It turned Israel into a wonderland because it's more of a desert place, you know, nowadays. And it turned into a wonderland. People were hiking and nomadics went up into the mountains where they wouldn't normally traverse, where the Dead Sea Scrolls sat in a cave for over 2,000 years before the time of Christ, just sat there in pottery. And one of them threw a rock in a cave and heard a pot break. Think this is a coincidence? I think this is God at work. He drove them up there with the snow. Is that crazy? They go in and they find these scrolls. They don't know what they are, how old they are. But guess what? Maybe they're worth something. They end up being the most, the most incredible archaeological find of the last century. And guess what you have? A copy of Isaiah that's over 200 years older than Jesus, buried, not buried, just hidden in the cave by the Essenes, who stuck them there. And it's not just a few verses here and there. It's the entire book of Isaiah from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to the end of Isaiah chapter 66. Guess what? The same as the Masoretic text. Showing for people, oh, the Bible's been translated over and over and over again, and you know, it's probably way different. Guess what? We have Isaiah, and we have it over, what? 2,000 years later, 
And it's the same because they took great care because they were, they were writing the word of God. And in Isaiah, we read about how the Messiah would be a male. And in Isaiah 9, 6, you can read Isaiah 9, 6 with me. And it says, for a child will be born to us. A what? A son. It's a boy. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor Mighty God. By the way, those two Hebrew words, Mighty God, are used of God throughout the Old Testament. Eternal Father, or better in the Hebrew, Father of Eternity. You see, because he is from where? From everlasting right? From everlasting. As we read, he'd be born in Bethlehem, but he'd be from everlasting, from the days of eternity. Here, he'd be, a, a, a child would be given to us, a, a, a child would be born, a son would be what? Given to us. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. There will be no end uh, to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and what? Forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Wow. Now these are prophecies. You see, we don't rest our faith in just something somebody said. These are prophecies that were written long before they would take place and they would all take place at a specific time as well. So we have not only... Uh, regard, in regard to his birth certificate, we don't only really have uh, that the fact that he would be a male, but we have the very place of his birth. We also have the father. What's the father's name? Almighty God. His father is God. However, guess what? He's the son of God, but he's also the son of man. Amen? You see, he was a descendant of King David, as we just read. And Mary was a descendant of David. However, his father wasn't Joseph. That was his adoptive human father. His father is God. And in Matthew chapter 3, we read about how the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. And Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he took humanity, son of man. And he took himself. God himself became a man. So when we speak of Jesus, we're not talking about simply man. And we're not talking about only God. We're talking about God, man. And Job cried out, God, I wish there was a referee between you and me because Job was like, man, I, I don't have the answers. I, and, and you know what? I wish he says he prayed for someone who could stand in the gap. And guess what? What better one to stand in the gap than God himself by becoming a man, the perfect mediator, God, man, between God and man. And the Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So his father on the birth certificate, you have the name of the father and you have the, fa the one at there, there at conception on the longer birth certificates, which would be the Holy Spirit. And you have the name of the mother, which would be who? Mary, of course. And you'll oftentimes have race. What race was Jesus? He was an Israeli. And we are even told from what tribe, we already read in Micah 5, 2, he would be from. The very tribe, from the tribe of Judah. Amen. And David was from the tribe of Judah, and he was a descendant of David. He was also, of course, from the human race. Amen? Because all of us are really one race of people. We all share, the Bible says, one blood, the same blood. And he would be born into the human family. It says, he came to his own, and his own received him not. Even though he made the world, the world did not know him. So his father, though, is God. And he was in the beginning with the father. And he is himself God. And John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Bible says, And the same was with God. And everything that was made was made by him. And it says, Nothing that came into being came into being but by him. In other words, Jesus made everything. We just read, he's mighty God, Father of eternity. Amen? That is so amazing to me. His weight. One thing you'll see in a birth certificate is the weight you see, and what is, it gives Jesus weight in the scripture. Now, it doesn't say, you know, you know, six pounds, two ounces, or 11 pounds, four ounces, but it tells us that he is heavy 
Because you see, it says he came with glory in John chapter 1, in grace. And the word glory is from the Hebrew word kabod. And when you read that word glory in the Old Testament, it means heavy. Something of incredible substance and power. In fact, it says when God's glory filled the temple, the priests and everybody in the temple had to get on their faces because of the pressure of God's glory. You know, just think of this light and smoke and just... I mean, I don't know exactly how it looked. You know, I'm thinking of the temple when smoke's coming out and the flashes of lightning. Well, in the temple, there was such a, 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 a manifestation of God's glory that it pressed down because it was so powerful. Well, guess what? When Jesus was born, I'm not talking about physical weight. I'm sure it wasn't like Mary wasn't like, oh, we need a wheelbarrow, you know? But I'm talking about the substance of who he is because it says in the book of Colossians that Jesus Christ, it says, it says, in Jesus, in, in, in his, it says, the fullness of the deity. And we, use this, we sang a song today that used the word deity. Deity means divinity, means, speaks of, it's God. Deity means God. It says, the fullness of the deity dwelt in him in bodily form. What's fullness mean? The totality. That just blows me away. All that God is dwelt in him in bodily form. That when you're looking at Jesus, Jesus said, when you see me, you've seen who? The Father. Mary, do you know who you're holding in that song? You're holding God. God had to become a man to take our humanity if he was going to pay the fine that we deserved. That's the only way it could take place. Because what we owed, because the wage of sin is what? Death was our death. That's the debt we owed to God. And that's the only way God could pay our debt is if he became a man and died in our place. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Now, when I think of his weight, when you think of his weight, think of how heavy Jesus is, man. He is just God in the flesh. No heavier person that ever existed because he's God and he's man. The name on the birth certificate, the name Jesus, the name Jesus. In fact, Mary was told that the child that in you is in you is born from the Holy Spirit. And by the way, she, the angel said, you shall name him Jesus, for he shall pay for the sins of his people. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You shall name him Jesus, for he shall pay for the sins of his people. I mean, what's the name have in connection with, you know, to take away the sins of people? What does that have to do with, well, simple. Because the name Jesus means what? God is salvation. God is salvation. And his name would be called Jesus. And you say, but Joe, that's not his incredible prophecy because that happened just before he was born. Ah, but it says this was to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah in the prophecy of Isaiah, in Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? It's the Hebrew for God with us. In fact, in the gospel, when it's the angel tells Mary, you shall name him Jesus. He shall be the son of the most high. You know, she'll you know, take the sins of his people away. It goes on to say, and this was fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, that his name would be called Emmanuel. You see, God with us. And then it translates the Hebrew word into the Greek language. For those who don't know the meaning of the Hebrew word, it says this means God with us. You go to Isaiah, it means exactly that. If you read Hebrew, it's God with us. Well, guess what? Well, wait a minute. His name is Jesus. That's right. God is salvation. Not only God with us, but showing the dimension that God being with us is going to save us. He's going to save their people from their sins. So Jesus' birth certificate, even his name, who he would be, God with us. See, Hebrew names in the Old Testament and the ones that were being used in the New Testament typically mean something you know, we name our names. We say, hey, you know, in America, in America, it's like, well, you know, and, you know, that's how we are in America. Just, how does it sound? 
The name sound, we like the way it sounds to the ear. Well, in the Hebrew, it's like, what does it mean? Okay, a lot of Americans want to know what it means, too, you know. That's cool. But you know what? They're, they didn't care how, what it meant, always. I'm, I'm sorry, they didn't care how it sounded, always. They want to know what it meant first. And Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, God saves. And by the way, I think the name Jesus sounds great, too. Yeshua, especially in the Hebrew Yeshua. Amen? Yeshua. God is salvation. And wow, what a name. Because in Acts 4.12, it says, there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. There's no other name given under heaven whereby men might be saved, but it's the name of Jesus. And in Acts 3, I love it, you know, because Jesus said to go baptize in his name and that they would have authority in his name, and all power in heaven and earth is given to me. And then there in Acts chapter 3, the church is just getting started. Jesus ascended, and there is a lame man, never walked since his birth, laying at the temple, begging. And the apostle Peter says, silver and gold have I none. Obviously, he wasn't the first pope, right? Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give unto you. Get up and walk. And the lame man got up before all the people, and walked. He got up. He walked. People were amazed. And he didn't only walk. The Bible says he leapt. He started, you know, leaping, skipping. And people were tripping out. How'd that happen? In the name of Jesus Christ. Later in the book of Acts chapter 16, a demon-possessed woman is following the apostle Paul and Silas. And they're preaching the gospel. And she is a new ager. Before new agers were really known. And they're preaching that Jesus is the only way to salvation. And she's saying, these men are servants of the most high God. That part was true. That's a half truth. But she went on to say, they preach to you a way of salvation. A way? There's no definite article before the word way there. Instead of the way, he's just a way. The Apostle Paul, after getting tired of it, turned around and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, the demon, I command, you to, I command you to come out of her. The demon left her. They took Paul and Silas, the businessmen, and whipped them because she was no longer able to practice her divinity. She lost her ability to deceive people with, by trying to tell their fortunes because the demonic power was gone. Because Satan can tell, he knows more than we do because he's, all, he's got demons everywhere, Right? They share information. He doesn't know the future perfectly, but he can make more educated guesses than we can because angels are higher than humans and they've been around for a while and they can manipulate certain events only to a degree. Only God knows all the details of the future. In the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And the demon left. In the name of Jesus. And in Philippians chapter 2, it says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the name of Jesus Christ, that he is what? that he is Lord. Amen? So that name, it's on his birth certificate in the Old and the New Testament and hundreds of years before he was even born. Wow. The date of his birth. The date of his birth. That's usually something that's on, that's got to be something that's on your birth certificate. The date of his birth. There's no more popular date than the date of Jesus' birth. Most of, the, of any date that's celebrated of someone's birth, it's the date of Jesus' birth. In fact, our calendars are separated, and most countries are, by what? B.C. and A.D., around his birth. History is divided by the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's awesome. And you know what? I praise God for his birth, and it came at the exact right time. In fact, it says in Galatians chapter 4 that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. In the fullness of time, meaning when the time was perfectly right, God sent forth his son. And wow, was it ever perfect. Because I'll tell you what, if Jesus would have come a few hundred years earlier, the gospel would not have been able to get out through human agency the way it was able to get out when he came. Because he came in the fullness of time, because the Bible said when the Messiah would have to come, the temple, there would still be a temple standing because it says he would suddenly go to his temple. 
And he went to his temple, and he drove out the money changers, you remember, with a whip. And, and he fulfilled the prophecy which, where he said, you're making my father's house a den of thieves, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer. It says in the Old Testament that he would do that. So the temple had to be standing when he came. The temple hasn't been standing since he came, has it? It was destroyed just a few decades later. And it says the scepter of Judah would not depart until Shiloh, peace, or the Messiah would come. And the scepter was still in Judah. There was still leadership in Judah. In fact, when he went to the Roman court, he also had to go to what court? The court of the Sanhedrin, the Jews. But after 70 AD, there was no more scepter in Judah, and it had departed. So he had to come at that time. And the fullness of time, it was perfect on the level of spreading the gospel because you see... If it wasn't for the Romans, and even though it was a very brutal empire, the Romans were the ones that built all the roads like nobody ever had before and connected all these different countries in the ancient world through building roads. It was a perfect time for the gospel, for the gospel we preached throughout the known world at the time. It couldn't have been done just 100 years before that. And guess what? The Greeks were ruling the world before the Romans. And what language were were a lot of the nations speaking at that time? Greek. If Jesus had come a few hundred years earlier, it would be really hard to communicate with other nations. However, guess what? The Greeks built the language or spoke the language that they spread throughout the world. And then the Romans built the roads. And the New Testament was written in Greek and it was taken by Paul and the apostles throughout those roads to share the gospel. And it reached us. It reached this country. It's reached all over the world. We have some ethnic groups to still hit, but we've already hit hundreds of different nations and thousands of different languages and dialects. And Jesus said, when the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the worlds and when it's to all the nations, then the end will come. Amen? When people were saying, oh, Jesus is going to come back, you know, years and years and years ago, when the gospel was barely getting preached, and people say, oh, you know, I've talked to people. Well, they said Jesus was coming a long, 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 long time ago. You know, it did happen. Well, guess what? Those guys weren't looking at their Bibles. Israel wasn't even a country then. There was no temple for the Antichrist to sit in. And Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom would preach in all the world, to all nations, then the end would come. So, you know, the Bible's not all wet. In fact, you, there, Jesus said those prophecies have to be fulfilled before he would return. And by the way, you are fulfilling prophecy, my friend. How? Well, look right here in 2 Peter. It says people would say to you, mockers, where's the prophet is coming? You're a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Wow, that kind of trips people out, by the way. You know, you're in the Bible. I am? Yeah, you're called a mocker by God. But a, another, you know, a few more verses, he says he doesn't will that you perish. It's a good, good way to go, by the way, because then you say, he loves you, he gave himself for you, and, you know, what have you. You can have a lot of fun witnessing, guys, you know. And I'll tell you what, man, he came in the fullness of time. Now, it's amazing to me because it says in the Old Testament that there would be a star that would come out of Jacob. He's a descendant of Jacob, right? And he's the bright uh, morning star, we're told in Revelation chapter 22. Amen. But we also read something fascinating, that the Magi came from the east, traveled long distances with gold and frankincense and myrrh, and they came to worship a king that was to be born. And the star led them to the destination the general destination. And they inquired, of course, of Herod whether a king had been born there. And of course, Herod wanted to know where that king would be born so he could kill that king because he didn't want any competitors. And that's why he put the edict out to kill everybody under two years old. And by the way, keep in mind that uh, Jesus was probably, you know, Not born right. It wasn't like they came to this manger when he was just born, you know. That's why Herod was killing everybody as of a certain age. It's a little bit later, probably. And what's interesting about this as well is they were going to see this star. But what's fascinating around the time of Christ's birth is we have within Chinese records and which within Korean history, documented history within both these cultures and as well here in Israel, that there was this fantastic light that shone at that time. In fact, the uh, Chinese and Koreans say they thought it was a comet, but it had no tail, and it just rested in the, in, the, in, the, in the heavens for a period of time. That's in their literature. Oh, by the way, did any of you guys, uh, were any of you so blessed to see Venus and Jupiter and the moon aligned earlier this month, near the beginning of the month? 
How many saw that? Raise your hand if you saw that. Was that crazy? I didn't even read about that coming up. I was just out one night, you know, uh, going to my car or something. And also I'm like, whoa, what is that? You know? I, I, I knew Christ was already born, so I knew that wasn't happening. <laughs> but I was like, man, because you had the, the moon, you know, and then you had, I think it was, uh, you had, uh, it was Jupiter, which is, you know, a huge planet, was up above or just over, and then you had Venus a little bit lower. And they were really close together, and it was so bright in that area. Well, I thought that was fascinating. And then I was, secular news I'm listening to, they were saying on the secular news, you know, astronomers believe that this could have been the kind of alignment like this that led the Magi or the wise men to the baby Jesus. And I thought, I can't believe they're saying this. And it was like, you know, like on a, on a, a CBS or NBC, one of those, those news sources. And then, you know, what's interesting is I looked a little bit more into that because, you know, some believe it was like a supernova. Uh, there's different beliefs as to what it was. But I thought it was interesting. Professor of Notre Dame, who's writing a book on this right now, or they, he's planning on writing a book. I don't know if he started yet. He's a, he's a, a theoretical astrophysicist. Okay, his name is Grant Matthews. Uh, he's writing a book, and, uh, he, and he has, there's Kepler and others who have made speculations with mathematical formulas as to what planets were where at what, that time. Well, this guy has an advantage. He has access to the U.S. National Aeronautics uh, and Space Administration's databases. So he can look at what was where when, right? And he tells us that in 2 B.C., 2 B.C., Jupiter and Venus uh, were in alignment with the moon very closely. I mean, it could have been, they could have been so aligned where it just looked like one huge ball of light just sitting there. And by the way, if you've, you saw Venus and, and uh, Jupiter and the, the moon and what have you, you'll notice it wasn't just one night. It was several nights from uh, no, late November into December and what have you. And if you can picture them very close together, when the skies were clear in those days, it could have been just so radiant and so powerful. And this was, he puts at 2 B.C. Now keep in mind, they would have seen it earlier first to get them in the direction. And they would have gone into that direction because it would be a long trip. And some say it would have come as early as a couple years possibly. And many people date the birth of Christ actually our calendars. The monk that put the, you know, the, the, the dates together, they feel like the you know, birth of Christ was a couple years before, uh, you know, BCAD, that transition period, they believe some two, three, four. But one thing we do know, and what's interesting about what this astrophysicist does, he shows there were a few different things going on with alignments at that time. So was it Venus and, and Jupiter and, and the moon? And by the way, the cool thing about that is you don't need a telescope. You don't need a telescope to see this alignment like you would with planets. You understand that? Why? Because Venus and Jupiter are the brightest planets in our solar system. You understand that? Jupiter's so big and the proximity. And I could imagine, I mean, can you imagine seeing something like that then? Is that what they saw? I don't know. I know they saw something. I know what happened. I don't know it's going to be kind of a trip. I'm, I sure hope there's a lot of videotape of a lot of things that went down back then. I'll spend a lot of time in heaven watching God's videos, you know? I mean, can you watch, I mean, see Samson, you know? Be better than UFC type stuff, right? <laughs> Samson was just wild, man. So... Uh, but anyway, guys, what an incredible thing. And, and what's interesting about this too to me is it was the Magi that came. The Magi, they weren't Jews. They weren't Hebrews. It's like, and they didn't just come because they saw the star. They came armed with information. They had revelation knowledge that this would be a king deserving of worship. Born in Israel, and the star led them there. Where would they get this kind of information, though? Because it's just looking at some star or an alignment of planets, and, and, the, and the Hebrew and Greek words used for stars aren't always speaking specifically with stars or planets. There's a Greek word called, named asteros, or where we get asteroid from, but it speaks of, you know, uh, you know, stars. Sometimes those words are used because there weren't technical words always used. But we do know this, that where do you read about magi in the Old Testament? What book? Amen. The book of? Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, it talked about the coming, the time of Messiah. And the book of Daniel was written in 
Babylon. And Daniel worked alongside who? The Magi in Babylon. The only time you find the Magi is in Daniel working with a man of God. And now he won't do their practices. He won't eat things sacrificed to idols. He won't bow down to the image, just like Shadrach and Meshach won't. And he gets in trouble for it. And the Magi are jealous of him. But when none of them can interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he can. And they all recognize who he is. Nebuchadnezzar recognized that he's heard from God. So in the book of Daniel, which the Babylonians would have had access to, you find Daniel crying out to God because he's in exile in Babylon. God, you know, he knew the time was up because Jeremiah said that you guys will go into slavery in Babylon for 70 years because of your disobedience to God. And they were there. Just like Jeremiah said, nobody wanted to leave Jeremiah. They threw him in a pit, you know, hoped he would die. And they said, you know, uh, God said that his, his people wanted to hear lies. They didn't want to hear the truth. And guess what? That prophecy is being fulfilled. Yet there were other prophecies. And to Daniel came the angel Gabriel. And he gave him this elaborate prophecy, which we don't have time to get totally into. But suffice it to say, he told Daniel, comforted him, and said, you will be brought back into the land of Israel. And he said that after the decree is given to rebuild Jerusalem, there will be, he said, 483 years. And then after 483, until Messiah the Prince, and he shall be, what? Cut off. 69 sevens, 483 years. Until the Messiah would be cut off? Yes. And guess what? What was the decree? We find in Nehemiah chapter 2, King Artaxerxes of Persia, who took over the Babylonians, and they let what? The Israelites go back to Jerusalem. And by the way, that's in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter, in the book of Isaiah, there's Isaiah again. He says that God would rise a shepherd up by the name of Cyrus, and he would make it so the Jews could go back to their land. And by the way, you can go home today, and you could look up the name Cyrus in your encyclopedias, and you can read about how Cyrus was a benevolent king who took over the Babylonians and let the Jews go back to Israel. That doesn't happen, guys. Okay? But it happened. And God even said his name before he was born. There's a lot of reasons I'm a Christian, but these are just some of them. Okay? There's a lot of good reasons. And it's just a blow mind. But the Lord also prophesied from the decree to go back, rebuild Jerusalem, would be 483 years until Messiah the Prince, and he'd be, he'd be cut off. Well, guess what? Artaxerxes, you can read, you can look it up. Read when the decree was given by the Persians to send the Jews back to Jerusalem, 444, 445 B.C. You use the Babylonian calendar. It was written in, Daniel was written uh, in Babylon, and the, the, the lunar calendar was being used. And Daniel's days for years matched the days for the lunar calendar, 360-day years, because they would have, you know, we didn't do the leap thing like we did it. They did it a little differently. And you add up the days, and it brings you to the very crucifixion of Christ. What's a blow mind is they had that book, most likely. They knew that the Messiah would be coming around. If he was going to die on such and such a time, they knew he had to be getting, he was going to be born pretty soon, prior to that time, amen? And then all of a sudden there's this strange phenomenon. These guys are astronomers, keep in mind, that they've never seen before. Right when they know the Messiah would likely be born around that time, and they hightail it over there. And they say, is there a, you know, and of course Herod tries to, you know, the fox kind of situation. But they end up getting to Jesus and worshiping him. And by the way, you're only supposed to worship God. A lot of scriptures that deal with Christmas and his birth show how he is the son of God. He is God in the flesh. So the very date of his birth, the circumstances of his birth, you know, his name, you know, all these things are so powerful and so awesome. Blood type. Blood type. A lot of different blood types. You know, you may have A, you may have O. You know what kind of blood type Jesus had? His was A plus. Okay? Perfect. Perfect blood type. I was thinking about that today. I go, what can I, I always say it was perfect. And I thought, A plus, there it is. He gets an A plus for his blood type. Amen? Jesus had A plus blood type. It was perfect. 
because he was without sin. It says he would be without sin. There's no guile found in him. Isaiah 53 again. And our blood type is flawed. Every one of us. Thank God we have blood. And amen, we'd be dead. The Bible says the life is in the blood. That's our, it's our life's blood we speak of. In fact, long before science realized that life was in the blood, Leviticus 17.11 says that the blood shall be given on the altar because it's blood that atones for the sin and the life is in the blood. See, that's why the blood has to be shed. That's your life. And in fact, when we read about Jesus giving his life, we read about his death for our sins, but oftentimes it says he shed his blood for our sins because that's death. You lose your blood. We didn't know that. Modern science, I mean, in George Washington's day, which was just a couple hundred years ago, not too long ago, relatively speaking, just over 200 years, George Washington, how did they try to save him? You remember, if you look at your history, they tried to bleed him to death. Let's get all this blood out of him. And when they bled him to death, he died. They killed him. You know, he's already probably going to die, so I'm not saying they're committing murder, but they bled him to death. Well, now we'd say, you won't do that. Unless someone's got bad blood, you give him a blood transfusion. But all of us, you know, some of our blood's different. I mean, we all have, if you have AIDS or something like that, your blood is, there's a death warrant in everybody's blood, though. Everybody here has life in their blood, too, so to speak, but it's, there's a death warrant written within us, the scriptures say. We're all dying. The day you're born, you're dying as well. You're growing, but you're dying. We weren't created to die. The Bible says God created us with eternity in our hearts. The first human beings, and it wasn't until they rebelled against God that death came upon them because of their sin. Now, what's amazing, though, is Jesus, his blood type was not determined by an earthly father like ours because he didn't have a what? Earthly father. Amen? He had a heavenly father only. He was born from Mary, but his blood type comes from the Father in heaven. He's perfect. In fact, look, if you will, at Acts chapter 20. Oh, by the way, when those Jehovah Witnesses come knocking on your door and you don't have a lot of time and you're really busy, get this verse out. Just share this verse with them. It would be sufficient to make them think. Acts chapter 20, or a Mormon, or whoever. Acts 20, verse 28. It says in verse 28, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Paul's speaking to the elders at the church of Ephesus. To shepherd the church of who? To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his what? Own Own blood. Is that powerful? But by the way, if the Jehovah's Witnesses open their Bible, they add one word in there. And they rearrange the word. They put the blood of his own, and then they add the word son. Okay. They say, oh, see, Jesus is not God. He's just, you know, an angel. And it's his blood. They add the word son there. All you have to do is get an interlinear or a Greek New Testament with the transliteration of the English words, and you'll see there's no word son there. And they have to admit that. The Jehovah's Witnesses do admit that if they know better. They added the word son there. You won't see son in other translations. Because God, which he purchased with his what? own blood. Jesus is God and man. And when he shed his blood, it was the blood of the God man. And it was perfect. It was perfect. You see, I love you. We love each other. But we could never lay our lives down for each other when it comes physically, yes. Spiritually, no. You might be able to save someone's life physically by stepping in front of a bullet. But spiritually, you cannot take their penalty because guess what? Number one, you already have to take your own penalty if you don't know Jesus, right? Number two, you don't have spiritual life. We all have the death sentence, right? Only one person has lived a perfect life, only one human being without sin, amen? And could actually give his life for us and has a spiritual life to give. And by the way, if you had a perfect life and you were absolutely perfect, you never sinned, you could probably give your life, if God allowed it, for one person. Because you're just one person, right? But Jesus is more than just one human being. The reason he gave give his life for everybody is because he's who? God, man. And his life is more valuable than everybody's put together. 
And he could die for us all with one death. Isn't that amazing? It's like, yeah, but he didn't have to go to hell. I mean, if he suffered our punishment, how could we have to go to hell? Because guess what? He's infinite. God is infinite, right? And when God suffers, he suffers in an infinite way because he's infinite, right? So when he suffered, he suffered in an infinite way as the God-man, and it was payment for each and every one of us, and he conquered death. Amen? Wow. Now, there's a woman we read about that had a really bad problem, and she was hemorrhaging. She was leaking blood constantly for 12 years straight. She couldn't get any help. Doctors couldn't help her. Could you imagine bleeding every day? 12 years, you're just straight. Every day, blood is pouring out. You've got bandages, and, and, you're, and, and it was far worse than you realize. When you read the text, it's one thing, but when you realize the background with the text, it's quite amazing. Go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And read about this woman uh, in Luke chapter 8, the woman with the issue of blood. Quite amazing. Verse 43. It says, And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Now this is quite incredible because, you see, in the book of Leviticus, if a woman was going through her menstrual cycle that time of the month, and, and she wasn't allowed anywhere near the temple. She wasn't allowed in the outer courts because you see the blood it was that time of the month. And our blood as humans is what? Unclean. In fact, when a woman goes through her menstrual cycle, what's it doing? It's bringing out impurities from her body. That's what's really going on. There's a lot of impurities in that blood. And she couldn't be at the temple because it was, there was if a man was bleeding at the temple, he couldn't with and allowed at the temple. If he had an issue of blood coming out of him, Obviously not from a period, but from a wound or something. He had to also, he was also banished from the temple. And this is quite interesting to me because, you see, uh, this woman, now the rabbis had a practice of adding all kinds of laws upon laws upon laws and customs. So this lady, when you looked at the biblical law, there was a good reason for it when we understand the spiritual reasons behind it and what God was doing. But the rabbis really extrapolated to a degree, and in a rabbinical law, a few things would happen. Likely, it was likely that her husband would divorce her. So her husband would divorce her. She would be excommunicated from the synagogue. Now, the temple was the main place of worship that Jewish men were to go three times a year, but the synagogues were the local places of worship where they would meet on the Sabbath. She would be excommunicated from the Sabbath. I'm sorry, from the synagogue. And number three, she'd be ostracized by society. Okay? She, the people would turn when they saw her. They wouldn't want to associate with her because a lot of the rabbis associated a hemorrhage like that of flowing blood that didn't stop with personal sin, you see. They attributed it to personal sin. They made it a personal thing. Where really, we all have problems because of sin in general. Sometimes there are specific things that happen in our lives because of personal sin. And sometimes God heals us, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he doesn't because like Paul had the thorn in the flesh because he's teaching us lessons. Or like the psalmist said in Psalm 119, you know, he thanked the Lord for his afflictions. He says, because it's through them that I have come to learn your decrees or your word. You know, and this blind man over here, Jesus heals, he heals him for the glory of God. Job doesn't get healed for a long time and he's blameless. More blameless than any man, but he's sicker than any man at that time. So you never know. That's why you've got to be really careful to not be quick to think this is for this and that's for that. Well, the rabbi said it must have been because she did something wrong, you know, and they ostracized her. Now, I want you to understand the destitute state that this woman is in, likely divorced, separated from her family or kids, you know, can't go to the synagogue and worship, you know, ostracized by her friends, and she's very, very sick. And she probably has no money because she spent all her, when you compare the gospel accounts on this, she spent all her money on doctors, it says. So she was poor, probably a beggar. So I want you to really consider the state that this lady's in. Really sad. 
And yet something fantastic happens. We read in verse 44 that she came up behind him, that is Jesus, came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his cloak and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. In other words, Peter saying, hey, come on, Jesus, because Jesus was healing and so popular and, and all these crowds were always around him and, you know, in the, you know, just thick. And Peter's like, who isn't touching you, Jesus, you know? I mean, everybody's pressing on you. And that's not what Jesus was talking about. He's not talking about who bumped into me or who rubbed my shoulder. He's talking about something altogether different. And we read in verse 46, but Jesus said, someone did touch me, for I was aware that power has gone out of me. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, (laughs) notice by who? Jesus. Isn't that great, though, that Jesus sees her? He wants her to confess it. He knew who who touched him. She didn't escape his notice. He wants her to publicly confess what happened. And give thanks and let people know what happened, what she did. Because he wants to also commend faith. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him. Now keep in mind, she had been so ostracized by society. And this is the Messiah. And she feels so unworthy. And then she she touches him. And she's like, I mean, but for her to press through the crowd. and, And I mean, this lady, that took some doing. And when you lose blood too, habitually you lose strength. She mustered up a lot of faith, guys, and she went and touched him. And trembling, she fell down before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Wow. And he said to her, daughter, I love that, daughter, recognized her as a child because of her faith. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Wow. And I just think it's wonderful because she touches the cloak of his garment, you know. He is the high priest, amen. And she finds immediately immediate healing from her sicknesses, her, her sickness. And she couldn't get the medical help because they didn't know how to stop it for 12 years. But God wanted to be the one to uh, bring the healing forth. Now, I think it's amazing because she was in such a, a miserable, miserable state. Wouldn't you be miserable if you were in her condition? Ostracized and going through all that and all your money gone. And I mean, I can't even imagine being, and I don't even, it's hard to even go there in your mind like, wow, we have been uh, so blessed in, in so many ways. But I'll tell you what, uh, we all have a similar problem that she has. Humans do in general. Humans have been separated from God, we've been divorced, you see. We've, the Bible says that our sins have separated us from God. The Bible speaks of the whole human race committing apostasy. Apostasy, by the way, is re- related to a Greek word for divorce. God divorced, specifically divorced the nation Israel. We were never married to him as a people uh, like Israel was, but I'm speaking uh, uh, Metaphorically, we were separated from God. And that's what divorce means. It means to, to uh, you know, for there to be a, a, a separation. That's a finality kind of thing. But the whole human race was separated from God. And guess what? We couldn't go to God's synagogue in heaven. Amen? And guess what? We were alienated or ostracized from the heavenly assembly of the angelic beings because of our sin. And guess what? We tried all kinds of different ways to get right People have tried gurus and uh, philosophers and all these different things, and guess what? They never got us healed. They never got us right with God. They never got our sins forgiven, never got us access into heaven, did they? Because there's a limitation of what humans can do. And we can say, and a lot of people, and most people, think that they can do it by good works. The average person you share with, if you think they're, you ask if they're thinking they're going to heaven, most people will say yes today. Most people still aren't atheists. Atheism is only, even though they make a big deal about it in the media, it's only 10% of the nation, which blows me away because there's been constant propaganda on a lot of the TV stations and, and billions of years ago, you know, when this big bang took place and we evolved out of nothing, you know. And after all that brainwashing, people still see there's something wrong with that. 
you know? So, but at the same time, I'm not saying it's not a real threat. You need to have answers for these guys. But it's amazing. Most people say, when I witness, I'll say, hey, and a lot of times I'll start with a question about, you know, uh, if you die today, you know, where would you go? You know, and they'll usually say, heaven. And I'll say, well, why, why would God let you know it's heaven? And they'll usually say, because I do a lot of good things. And that's almost always the answer. Almost. Have you witnessed and found that true to be true? That's usually the answer. And it's not the case, though, because the Bible says that salvation is not by good works. In fact, the Bible says that all of our good works are as what? Filthy rags. And filthy rags, we talked about the Hebrew word means what? Menstrual cloths. Right? That's heavy. Well, the menstrual cloth has blood on it, and that blood is what? Impure. It has impurities in it. And it's, a, it's, it's you know, there's cleansing agents in that blood, but it's trying to fight to stay alive and keep the person alive, but it, we're dying. And when we say, hey, God, look at all my good works, it's like shoving a menstrual cloth in his face and say, look at this, God. And God's saying, whoa, whoa, you know, that's not going to give you good works. You, you know, that keeps you out of the temple. That's your blood. You need my blood, God says. Amen? All of us should be kept out of the temple, men and women. Amen? All of our blood is impure. And that's why God it says in Acts 20, 28, bought the church of God with his own blood. Amen? Because his blood type is what? A plus. Amen? Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. And my hope and prayer for each person here is that not one of us would miss the meaning of Christmas. Not one of us would miss having our sins cleansed. Not one of us would miss Jesus turning to us like he did her and calling her daughter or us son or daughter, depending on your gender. And have you made the decision that that woman made? That woman could have made every excuse in the world. I'm too tired. Nobody else has been able to heal me. Oh, look at all these other people, you know. They've rejected me. But you know what? She said, no, I'm going to go forward and push through and touch the hem of his garment, touch the fringe of his cloak. I'm going to press through. And that was a deal. And she pressed through and in faith and touched the hem of his garment, boom, immediately healed. Now, we can't touch the hem of Jesus' garment physically right now. And most of you probably aren't hemorrhaging from blood, but we're all hemorrhaging spiritually if we don't know Jesus, amen? But you can still touch Jesus. And you can become a child of God, and you become healed from your bloodletting, which will continue until you die, and you'll miss God forever. You can continue in that state, or you can say, you know what? I'm going to touch Jesus. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be saved. Amen? And I love it because Jesus looked to her, and when you come to him, he looks to you. Because he says, whoever comes to me, she came to him. I won't cast away. And he didn't cast her away. And little kids came to Jesus. And the disciples tried to shoo him away. He said, they told him not to do that. Let them come to me. Hinder them not for such are the kingdom of God. Remember the Canaanite woman, the Phoenicians, a Phoenician woman, a Canaanite, despised by the Israelites, tried to go to Jesus. And if you read it carefully, you'll see that she was rebuffed at least about three times by the disciples two different times, by Jesus in his first words, shall I give that which is for the children to the dogs? Why was Jesus saying that? He was testing her faith. And she said, even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. And he said he hadn't seen faith like that in all of Israel. And she came to him. And everyone that came to Jesus Christ, he delivered you don't see one case in all of the Bible of someone coming to Jesus and him refusing to deliver them. Now, he didn't always deliver them when they expected it. One guy, he actually healed, but it took two different times things that Jesus did to heal him, you see. And all of us who know Jesus will be healed ultimately. All of us are still dying physically, but will be resurrected, amen, and ultimately healed. Now, the amazing thing to me is that Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will not, what, 
cast away. Jesus is the ultimate gift, and he is for each and every one of you. Every one of us will die. Every one of us will face God. Every one of us needs to be forgiven unless we've already been forgiven by Jesus and are trusting him. And guess what? Just as we've looked at Jesus Christ's birth certificate, God will look at your birth certificate. I'm not talking about your physical birth certificate. I'm talking about your spiritual birth certificate. You see, you know the day, most likely, maybe you don't, but most of you probably know the day you were born and there's birth certificate as evidence and what have you. And praise God for birth certificates. I, I like to have proof of birth certificate when I travel, you know, and what have you, uh, or to be able to get a passport. But you need a spiritual birth certificate to get your passport to, tra- to travel to heaven. And that means not the day you were born physically, but the fact that you were born spiritually. I could ask my wife the day she was born again, and she can give me the date. And even if you forgot your date, God knows the date. And you also receive a new name, says in the book of Revelation. On your, you know, when you were spiritually born again, the Lord Jesus says for overcomers, he gives them a new name. Wow. And your citizenship, well, wherever you're born again, you might know where you were born again, the place, but where your residence is, your residence in, the Bible says that you are citizens of heaven. That's where your home is. So you have a, and guess what? The Bible says that Jesus will open the book of life and he'll look for the names in the book of life. If your name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, you'll be thrown, it says, in the lake of fire. Now, why does it say the Lamb's book of life? It's called the book of life and sometimes the Lamb's book of life. Why the Lamb's? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. And by the way, if you, if you look up Revelation 13.8 and Revelation 17.8, you'll see the term book of life and Lamb's book of life are used at the same book interchangeably. Speaking of the same book. But why Lamb's book of life? Because Jesus is the Lamb that gave his life for us. And if we turn for our sin and we ask him for forgiveness of our sins, we're cleansed of our sins and we're, our names are written in that book and we've passed from death to life. Amen? And I hope that everybody here has received the greatest gift you could possibly receive, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? He's the undescribable gift. Hey, did we, I think they taped the message. If you didn't miss, make the Christmas party, you want that tape. I think they taped uh, a few days ago. We, had, we talked about Jesus being the undescribable gift. He's the ultimate gift, guys. And you can get everything in the world and not have Jesus this Christmas, and you have lost out big time, and you are a loser with a capital L. Because Jesus said, you can gain the whole, whoever gains the whole world, you know, we warned about those who gain the whole world but lose their what? Soul. Yet if I have Jesus right now, and you take the very shirt off my back, I still have everything, amen? Because my name's written in the last book of life, and I'm going to heaven because I have Jesus. Don't miss out on eternity. You can have eternal life right now. If you've come here today and you're like, yeah, I'm coming and it's Christmas time, but you really haven't surrendered to Jesus and accepted him as your Lord and Savior, now's the time to do it. Simply bow your head with me right now. And whether you've received him or not, let's all pray. But for those of you who haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior yet, he said in John 1, 12, the, the gospel, John says, as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. Simply say, Jesus Christ, I receive you right now as my Lord And as my Savior, I repent of my sins. Lord, I know that I have to repent. I need to turn from my wicked ways to you. But Lord, I also recognize that I'm not perfect. I'm far from it. And I struggle with certain things. Please, you give me the strength. You clean me up, Lord. I just simply will to let it go and turn to you as Lord of my life. Give me the strength to be the person you want me to be. But more so, Lord, I thank you that I can't work for my salvation, but that it's a free gift. That your word says that we're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves, but that it's your gift. Not of works lest I should brag. And Father, I thank you that your son said that you so loved the world that you gave, you gifted, you gave your only begotten son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I put my trust in him now. And I thank you for the greatest gift of all, eternal life in Christ forever. Fill me with your spirit. Help me read your word so I can be strong and be the child you've called me to be. And help me stay in prayer. And help me to not get lost in the materialism of this season, but help me get found in Jesus every day, recognizing that it's all about him. In his name we pray. Amen. Praise God, you guys. Let's stand and we'll pass out the cup and the bread. Israel, town, Bethlehem, right? You know? And blood type, A+, plus, amen? Bethlehem, because he's the bread from heaven, amen? Born to us from the house of bread. Father, we thank you for the bread, which represents your son's body, which was given for us. And your great love, Lord. You're just so amazing, Father. We just praise you. Just tell him in your own words how much you're thankful for Jesus' birth. Just, just tell him. You, you can out loud, you can say it beneath your breath, but just tell him, Lord, thank you. Father, we thank you. Just go ahead and tell him how much you love him. We praise your name, Lord. You are so good. Father, we praise your holy name. We love you so much. Thank you for sending your son, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we partake of the bread with thanksgiving and remembrance of the sacrifice he made for us to bring us into your kingdom in Jesus' name. Bethlehem, not only because it's the house of bread, but it's where what was produced, all the lambs, amen, that would shed their blood, not because they're equivalent to humans, far inferior, but they were a good picture of innocence of the Lamb of God, who is the perfect God-man who gave his blood for us, amen. So Father, we thank you for the sweet fruit of the vine. As Jesus said, we are the branches. And Father, that you are the husbandman, you are the farmer, and that he is the vine. And Father, he gave forth his blood for us and used the fruit of the vine as a picture 
of his blood because it's sweet and it pictures who he is who gives us eternal sustenance through his sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.